Sound design. Yeah. So basic IEM link budget. Steven, what are we doing here? All right, we're trying to, this is actually kind of one of my more favorite topics about IAMs because we are broadcasting signal and trying to get it to tiny little packs that have a, uh, that are, are weaker than our, our, you know, our big receivers, their big antennas. And so we really need to focus on how much signal we're pushing out these antennas to get to those little packs that are hidden by skin and, and, and clothes. And this one can be a little bit challenging. So link bud is really helpful here. And this is a fun topic. So. Yeah. Cool. If this is the first video you've seen of Steven and I, we have done two more previous. So you might want to go back and check those out. Um, there's one we just did about uh, wireless microphones. And there's one that we did about antenna placement. And so now we're doing um, something similar, but for your in-ear monitors. Um, okay. So just like the previous one, it looks like we've got a start here and a finish. And we've got a target uh, with these numbers here that Again, make me think of a bullseye. We're trying to get uh, somewhere in the middle where we're not getting so low that we have dropouts and or so high that we have overloads, correct? Absolutely. And we've got this tiny little antenna here that needs to catch that, and it's moving around the stage, you know, wherever the performer is. It's a challenging little antenna right there that we need to hit. <laughs> okay, so we've got this infographic, and it should be fairly self-explanatory. Um, but I'm going to try to get through it by myself, and wherever I start stumbling, I'll ask you questions. Sounds great. Okay. Uh, okay, start, end. Here's a flow chart. It goes like this, and it looks like each step in the chain, I'm going to have either some um, gain or some loss, which are signaled by these plus and minuses. Correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and just so you know, we're going to go through this uh, just talking about how the link budget is done. And then afterwards, we're going to switch to this one, which actually has real numbers in it. So you'll be able to, we'll talk about how you can put your own numbers for your RF setup into this link budget. Okay, so we're starting here with a transmitter that's in the rack or sitting on a table. And that has some amount of gain. And that we just look up in our spec sheet, right? Yes. Uh, or uh, sometimes we'll say on the front screen, if you're scrolling through, uh, uh, depending on what manufacturer you're using. Oh, so uh, you can it, set that as well. How much gain yeah, is coming out of that yeah. transmitter? So it should be able to tell you on the front screen about what, what's coming out of it. And now this one's going to be harder for me because I have only worked with IEMs a handful of times. It's not a part of my day-to-day -day work, um, but I need to understand it better. So I might have more questions about this. So this will be fun. Yeah. <laughs> so from that transmitter, uh, we have to use a cable to get to a combiner if we're using one. Um, right. and so, if we're using multiple, yeah. Okay. And so that would be if, you know, you have several musicians on stage and you don't want to have, uh, you know, 20 different transmitter antennas all up on stage. You just want two, right? Yes. Okay. We're going to have some amount of loss with the cable. And then some amount of gain or loss, depending on what type of combiner we're using. That's correct. Okay. And I should, again, I should be able to just look those things up on the spec sheet and it'll tell me how that works. Yes. Uh, we've got another cable. So that's going to be a loss. Um, looks like we, we're going to need a little minus symbol here, right? I think the, the other one has it in it when we get to the next. Uh, the oh, there it is. Side. Okay. There's the minus symbol. There you go. Okay, cool. And... Plus antenna gain. So, and the antenna is going to be always some amount of gain. Yes, for for our purposes, um, for the most part, we're always going to see gain from an antenna, uh, or or zero, no gain. We're pretty much not going to see negative. That's again a very rare circumstance. There is one I can think of that does it, but uh, that's a, a boutique or a specialty antenna that uh, I think we don't necessarily need to cover on this one right now. And is there ever omnidirectional transmit antennas? I think I've only ever seen directional antennas that would have some amount of forward gain, right? Um, absolutely, yeah. Only directional antennas have forward gain. Um, omnidirectional antennas definitely can be used for IEM. And, and oh, sometimes okay. uh, it definitely works better when you have a very, very tight space. You really don't need a huge amount of directional gain because if you're so tight that you have someone right next to the antenna, they may not have good coverage there. Um, also. A lot of times, guys that are blocked somewhere, let's say, um, from my background, monitor engineers, a lot of guys will put their Q-Pack on omnidirectional antenna close to monitor world because when you have 
a directional antenna on stage facing the artist, you're a lot of times in the null. And when that signal is trying to fight through a giant metal console to get to your pack, you get a lot of dropouts doing that. And so you'll see a lot of guys have omni antennas in modern world. And like I said, in, in smaller environments, omni antennas, honestly, are better than directional for IM. Interesting. Okay, cool. Okay, so then we're going to have some amount of loss due to polarization mismatch. Mismatch. That's hard to say. It is. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about this more in the last video, so don't we don't need to cover everything again. Um, but my understanding now is that um, this is always going to be a loss because we'll never have our antenna orientation and our transmitter orientation exactly matched. That is correct. And even if we have them, if we physically put them side by side and have them directly matched, our reflections are not going to be directly matched. So we're always going to have some loss there. Got a lot it, of reflections are at. Yeah. And the other interesting thing that I learned from you in the last video is that even with our LPDA uh, shark fin antennas, if we have a fixed insulation maybe where we know that our microphone is going to be placed like this, we, sh we should turn our um, antenna sideways. And that's why we often see people turning their antennas at a 45 degree angle because you're sort of um, uh, cutting your losses. What, what's a better yeah. way to say that? Getting the best of both worlds. If those worlds are horizontal or uh, vertical. Right. If you don't know if the you know, microphone is going to be held like this and spoken like this or turned like this. Okay. Yeah. All right. So some amount of loss there that we can... Um, we can estimate by if we can somehow know the angle of that mismatch in degrees. Um, but it sounds like also from our last conversation, that a lot of times we just assume a negative three dB loss here. Three is always a safe bet. You're not going to have, you usually won't have less than that um, unless you have a lot of your banking on reflections and you're able to predict that, which is pretty incredible. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah. You, you can assume three dB there. <laughs> Um, free space loss. This is the signal now traveling through the air. It's left the antenna. There's always going to be some amount of loss as it tries to get to the air. This number here, the distance in meters ha has the biggest effect on this calculation. If we know the frequency in megahertz, that can make it more accurate. Um, but really this has the biggest effect on how far away the receiver is going to be. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you go from maybe 470 to, 550 you might see a shift in 1 dB but if you shift from 12 meters to 13 meters you might see a shift in 5 or 10 dB okay um, yeah that's huge yeah and, and it is important to note that our free space path loss is our bulk of our loss so pretty much most of the loss we're going to see is in that actual wireless link which is why most people say to get their antennas get your antennas closer to the transmitters because we we close in that gap and we have less free space path loss and this, I mean, this seems like a moving target, really. I mean, do you really look at where's my performer going to be on stage? Because isn't the whole point is that if they're wireless, they can move anywhere. But I guess a lot of times people have like an area where they stay in, right? Or what's your thinking on that? Uh, you look for the farthest area that they're going to go. Oh, but, right. The farthest they could be. Yeah. So like I said, if it's... If it's an artist, if there's a, a catwalk or a thrust or a B stage, you know, make sure that you use that for your farthest point in your calculation. If it's a talking head for like a conference, if they're going to walk through the room for Q&A type situations, we need to make sure the farthest seat in the back of the house is the, the measurement we use for that to make sure we look for the farthest that wireless device is going to go and calculate for the worst possible scenario. Got it. Cool. And, th and that's the last step right now. So we should, if we had all those numbers, we'd now be able to uh, calculate our link budget and know whether or not we're hitting uh, within our target. Well, there's one more point, which is uh, the RX antenna gain. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's more. <laughs> so we mentioned briefly that microphones are a little bit hard um, because they are omnidirectional and the type of antennas they're using um, are pretty much zero dB. But we can assume basically about one dB from uh, a whip antenna because it is quarter wave. And if we assume that a dipole is 2.15, uh, half of that, uh, it would be close to one. Now we do have a bad ground plane. Uh, so we don't have the negative side of a quarter wave antenna, um, which is going to be something that's going to dive a little bit too deep here. But uh, we can assume, assume close to one dB for antenna gain on the uh, RX antenna or the, the IEM pack. Or if you want to be super safe, you can put zero again and assume worst case scenario. Got it. Cool.
Um, okay, so we've done all our steps. We kind of talked through it. Um, should we look at the example now? Sure. Ta-da! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it just got a whole lot more complicated. As oh, though yeah. this wasn't enough, this weren't enough steps. <laughs> um, and just to talk for a recap for a second about the motivation here, um, why do I want to look at this before a show? Why should I spend, you know, why should I spend my valuable time going through all of the steps in my RF signal chain? Well, I mean, I think actually let's equate this to audio. We don't, uh, let's say that you are a modern engineer. We don't just guess that that mic's not going to feed back and say, Hey, I think it's going to be fine. And then they walk out and then boom, feedback. And then you're stressed and struggling the whole night or same thing for front of house. You don't just set your PA up and assume, yeah, this is going to be great. And then, you know, you have some sort of crazy phase error or you're, you have 30 milliseconds delay on your, you know, whatever <laughs> from your left side, because you were trying some fancy thing. You didn't actually test it. Um, we need to basically be aware of um, what, what our limits are, what our limitations are. And also this uh, visualization uh, uh, basically kind of gets us more thinking about, every single step in RF system because one thing that's hard about troubleshooting RF is that it can be a lot of things and it can be any one of those things uh, each time. So if you have a drop, it could be this tiny cable within the rack or it could be this factor here and it could just be a factor that decreased your signal by two or three dB that took it out. But going through this and understanding what step, every single step in the chain uh, can kind of help you with troubleshooting and wrap your mind around the entire, wrap your mind around the entire RF system as a whole to kind of have some ideas of where to go when things start going south, if they do, or if you did your homework, right? They don't. And we're great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So if, if a problem is that I'm making assumptions about my gain staging of my RS system, then the solution is the link budget to write it all down. Sure. Yeah. We, we can have some solid confirmation of, yes, this is the plausible situation where this is going to work well, or we can know that this isn't going to work for us. So we need to change something. And uh, we, we, we eliminate the guessing. So tell me about the system we've got here. We're starting with a Sennheiser G3 set at 30 milliwatts. Is that what's happening? Yeah. And so um, for this one, because we're talking about IEMs, um, Sennheiser G3 is probably the most common that's out there um, for mid-level uh, type stuff. Uh, so I think most of us, if we have used an IEM, we'd probably use something similar to a G3. So I thought that was a good example for this. And uh, their maximum output is 30 milliwatts. And so we will be using that for our example. And for this one, I just decided to change it up from the last one and put it in 600 megahertz, which okay. is still legal because 608 is our, our cutoff at this point. Um, and then we're going to have six feet of RG8X cable, which is actually excessive. But again, I wanted to throw a curveball in there. So that's saying six feet in your rack. And maybe you have a really tall rack. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so six feet from your combiner, uh, from your transmitter to your combiner. And then for this one, we're actually, we're not using a, an active combiner. Like, you know, obviously we're using a passive one. So we're going to see some loss in there. That's that three to oh, two. Interesting. Eight. Okay. Yeah. So again, it's important to know the specs of the gear you're using. If you're using active combiner, you're going to have what's called a unity gain combiner. where you are going to have zero dB because it compensates for the loss that it creates. But in this case, because we're passive, using something similar to this guy, we have three dB of loss. And so we need to add that into our calculation. So each system is so different and we need to make sure we know what each step is and add it in there. From there, we kind of have a long shot. We're going to go down to 50 feet, but we're using 9913F7. What that is, it's that's the thick low loss cable. So we're going to save ourselves a little bit of loss there because we're using a low loss cable as opposed to if we use RG8X for that 50 feet run. Now we're going to go into a helical antenna, which is going to have a higher gain for us too. So we're going to compensate for some of that loss uh, for 3 dB which that's another thing to think about if you're designing a system. If you know you're going to have a lot of loss, we can make up for gain in things like antennas or less loss in cable. So we can kind of start balancing with designing these systems. Okay, yeah, so we're going to say negative 3 dB because we are fixed. So no matter how we orient the, uh, the receive pack, we know we are locked in at 3 dB. Uh, and then from there, we're going to say that our, our artist, our performer, our speaker, is 40 feet away. These two antennas are 40 feet away in free space. And so we're gonna calculate that path loss uh, by knowing our distance uh, and by knowing the megahertz, the frequency that we're working in. And we can calculate out the formula down here uh, and we can get our number of free space path loss. And actually, we've, we've actually used this formula quite a bit. Uh, if you're wondering what that minus 27.55 is, that's the correction because this is normally in, uh, I believe, gigahertz and kilometers. <laughs> so that is the, um, that's a constant to shift it down to what we're used to working in, 
which is megahertz. And then from there, it's pretty easy to convert to meters. Okay. Oh, and we should pause real quick because last time you taught me how to convert milliwatts to dB, uh, which we use in this whole formula here in, in this um, link budget. And so why don't I do that now? So 30 milliwatts, I'll go over to my calculator. I'll put in 30 log 10 times 10, and that'll give me 14.77, which is what you have here. There it is, yeah. That's that number in dB. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a thing. Awesome. If I remember this tomorrow. Um, maybe we should actually add this to the infographic here since cool. it's not super clear that how we got from here to here. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, great. We'll add that. Okay, so we we stopped at free space uh, path loss. Yes. So then from there, we, we have our actual RF link, which is the path loss from antenna to antenna. And then, so once we get to the other antenna, which is the little uh, quarter wave whip guy here on our IN pack, we have a little bit of gain there because a quarter wave whip does have a small amount of gain. That gain somewhat depends on the, uh, the actual ground plane around it. But we can say best case scenario, let's say one dB. If you want to shoot for worst case scenario, we can say zero dB. But uh, just for funsies, I put in one dB on this one to see uh, what we come up with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then we just add all those numbers together, whether or not it's a gain or at a loss at each stage in our chain here. And you came up with negative 30 dB, which puts us safely above negative 40, our um, green number here. And you've been telling me that, that that number will most likely be lower when we get out into the field, so it's good to shoot for a higher number. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have loss, uh, but things that are hard to predict, like body loss, and um, there'll be some fading uh, multipath loss. So okay. uh, it, it's good to shoot high and understand we're going to have maybe 20, 30 dB of loss in the field. So that puts us, because normally we could say that maybe 30 is getting a little too high, but that's perfect because the real world scenario is going to knock that down a little bit to where we're in a great spot for the receiver. Uh, and also, if we, we factor in that 3 dB of mismatch loss that I didn't actually put in there, we're at negative 33 um, if we want to be super particular. Um, uh, but yeah, that still puts us in a very good, very good area. So I would say that if we have this system and our artists or our whoever it is using the IEM is 40 feet away, they're going to have great signal. They're not going to have any problems. Awesome. Stephen, thank you so much for uh, putting this together. This is a lot more clear for me now that I've gotten to talk with you about it, even though I, I looked at it ahead of time. So if it's okay with you, I would love to invite people to post their own IM link budgets here below this video, and then I'll just ask you, you know, if they want, if you can give them feedback on them. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so this looks like a lot of work, but I think, you know, if anyone wanting to work on this just takes it step by step, Make out your list. What do I need to know next? Look it up in the specification sheet or you know, take the estimation. What's the farthest distance that receiver away could be away on stage um, and plug the numbers in. Um, then all you have to do is add them up. Beyond that, the math isn't very complicated. No, not at all. Just, just keeping, uh, keeping account of everything in that chain is the, main, is the hardest thing is knowing every single piece in that chain and what kind of loss or, or gain it's going to attribute. Awesome. Um, well, Stephen, thank you again for putting this together. And uh, for those of you out there watching this video, I'd love to hear how you do this. You know, if you uh, think that we're doing it wrong and you do it a different way that's better, that's, uh, that's fine. We'd love to hear about it. Um, so comment on the video and we'll keep the conversation going. Sound design. Yeah.